I want to welcome you all today to the first Graduate Admission Summit and the webinar, Engineer to Top MBA, Challenges and Opportunities, given by Gil Levy. Gil is the CEO of Vocaz.com, a service that helps engineers get into the top MBA programs. He's a former member of Wharton's Admissions Committee, and as a past applicant, Gil was actually admitted to the MBA programs at Harvard, Wharton, and INSEAD. His GMAT score was only 650, but his essay creation practices compensated for that. Gil received a full merit-based scholarship at Wharton, where he graduated with distinction. Upon graduating, he passed on a McKinsey & Company offer in order to head Go Refer Incorporated with a staff of 20 engineers. Afterwards, Gil led product management and marketing with BMC Software's security division. Today, he runs Vocaz.com, helping engineers get into the top programs. Without further ado, challenges and opportunities with Gil Levy. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us today for this uh, seminar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, where you are, I guess. Uh, let me get right started with uh, challenges and opportunities for engineers uh, planning to apply to the uh, top MBA programs. We'll start with uh, the first challenge, which is um, shifting from technical focus uh, to business focus. Uh, first, a bit of background for engineers out there who uh, don't know much about admission drivers. I'll start with that uh, in, uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, basically, your application space is limited, and you want to use this space uh, to promote admission drivers. Admission drivers are the elements that drive your admission, or in other words, the characteristics, the personality traits that the admission committees are looking for. It could be your leadership skills, negotiation skills, teamwork skills, planning skills, project management, persuasion, presentation, and other uh, similar skills, client management skills, initiatives, etc. So all these are things that the admission committee is looking for in a candidate. And um, as you probably know, different admission committees of different schools look for different drivers in different ways. For example, a school like INSEAD is looking for uh, international orientation, international experience more than other schools. A school like Harvard is looking for leadership skills uh, more than other schools, and is, look, is putting more emphasis on leadership skills. So, of course, you want to also tailor your application to each specific school and play on the admission drivers uh, and emphasize them, the ones that this school is looking for. So that's just a word of background about admission drivers, and now we'll talk about that challenge of shifting from technical focus to business focus or to admission driver focus. By the way, if you have any questions uh, on admission drivers, on chances, or, or, or on anything else that I say in this presentation, uh, you can contact us or me at vocaz.com slash introduction, um, and we'll be happy to help with uh, chances evaluations, answering any questions from this seminar, or anything else. All right. So uh, we spoke about um, the third challenge and the uh, admission drivers challenge, basically. Um, let's say you did great R&D work and your resume is full of R&D achievements. Uh, the R&D achievements will give you points on a couple of admission drivers, on things possibly like uh, creativity, if you invented some technologies, if you developed some patents, it could give you points on Things like analytical skills, if you solve really complex analytical problems. But the R&D achievements can only take you so far, and they are not likely alone to be able to uh, bring you into the uh, top schools. Do you need more uh, points on analytical skills if your GMAT is strong? Do you need more points on analytical skills if your GPA is high? Probably not. If your GPA or GMAT are around the average of people admitted to this school, then uh, most likely you're well covered on uh, the analytical admission drivers. And now you need to uh, start accumulating points uh, and impressing the admission committee on other admission drivers. Um, let's see what they are. Here uh, you can see 
uh, and I hope the, uh, the screen is clear enough. I think it may not be. Uh, what you can see here is um, basically the admission driver system that VOCAS is using uh, for, um, for planning um, a, a candidate application. So this is the admission driver table uh, for Harvard. You can see the school is HDS. And what you can see here is uh, basically columns. There's a column for each essay and each recommendation uh, that this candidate uh, is, is preparing. So for example, uh, the first uh, column would be uh, for the three greatest accomplishments essay of Harvard. So this guy, this guy is working on this essay and is going to talk about his uh, IBM achievements. You see there's some IBM uh, achievements here about the sale, about the setting up a department. Uh, and uh, we're, we're checking how many points this guy is getting on each admission driver based on this essay or from this essay. Uh, I'm sorry if the screen is cut a bit to the left. It looks like it is. Um, so the first admission driver is leadership. And you can see that the total sum of points for this guy on leadership is 12 points, which is, uh, which is not that high relative to, uh, to other admission drivers where this guy is getting more points. Uh, that means that we probably have to, uh, to switch some of the essay topics and look for essays that give us more points on leadership. Uh, on the other hand, you can see that, um, that here the, uh, the smart admission driver, the one, the, uh, the one on the third line, is getting 22 points, meaning this guy is very strong on smart. We don't need more points on that, so we may need to change the essay topic or the, uh, or the content of some of the essays. Even if we lose some points on smart, on an analytical skills, it's fine. But we need to accumulate more points on leadership where we only have 12 points right now and Harvard is heavily looking for leadership. Similarly, you can see uh, that the second essay, Learn from a Mistake, is getting in the uh, yellow line at the bottom only 12 points total on admission drivers. Uh, other essays are getting 22 points, 23 points. That means that this essay may be a bit weak in terms of admission chances and that we need to, um, to possibly change topic in order to uh, come up with a topic and content that will uh, bring us uh, further in the admission um, track, uh, in the admission road uh, for this candidate. So uh, these are really uh, just some points about, uh, about admission drivers. Uh, and um, let's see how it plays in reality. It all sounds nice theoretically. But in reality, uh, it looks like this. So we get a candidate who's giving us uh, these three bullet points for his uh, resume. Uh, that's the original that the candidate sent. So on the resume, software, development, software developer in charge of development of the entire read path section of the memory device in a solid state disk product, design, execution, delivery of an entire software product, implementation integration of two bootstrapping procedures in two different products requiring solo coordination with the hardware team. So far, technical focus. This guy needs to get into Harvard, Wharton, or another top school. This is probably not the right way to go. The right way to go would be to shift to a business focus. Uh, and let's see what that looks like. So after some work, uh, we're seeing here a shift to a business focus and to admission driver focus. Um, first, we, we split, we discuss with this candidate, um, what did you do over time? Did you do the same thing all the time? And we found out that actually, after uh, about half a year, this guy got more responsibility. So we, we, shift, we uh, split his position into two positions. One is software developer and then a promotion to software development project leader. Of course, this split was coordinated with his, uh, with his management, with his boss, who agreed to uh, split the uh, position or the resume, uh, the history in that way. So uh, this guy uh, becomes from a software developer, uh, from a regular software developer, we suddenly have a guy who was promoted to software development project leader and who can present two positions and a promotion. 
Um, so that in terms of splitting the position. If you are now a software developer, think about whether you can split the, uh, the title into two. Could be a, initially a software developer and then a senior software developer or things like that. Um, the other thing is shift to a business focus. Uh, as you could see before, it was all about technology, and now we have bullets like lead design execution and delivery of flash technology, not getting too much into what technology exactly, coordinate process with hardware systems and testing teams, selected by team leaders, leaders to be 15 member integration, work with marketing department, again, business orientation, lead led multi-team feature integration, improved performance speed by 600%, focused on achievements, facts, and numbers, worked on five-member team to develop central module of company-wide product, teamwork. So here you see how we're getting way more points on admission drivers, leadership, teamwork, initiative, etc. while before, originally, these guys got multi points maybe on some creativity and some analytical skills, but unfortunately not much more than that. So uh, to wrap it up on challenge one, you want to talk about a business solution to a business problem, not an IT solution to a tech problem. Even if you use your business skills only 10% of the time, you want to focus on that in your application, your resume, your essay, and dedicate to these achievements, these skills, at least 50% of your essay space. That would be challenge one. And before we move to challenge two, just a word about Vocaz and uh, what, uh, why I'm here today and what, uh, what we're talking about. So Vocaz helps engineers get into the top program. And all of our consultants are top MBA graduates or soon to be graduates and are engineers themselves who are in your shoes and were accepted to the top programs. Uh, the team has helped hundreds of engineers over the years. And um, to, uh, for further details, you can go to vocaz.com slash introduction, get in touch, ask any questions, get help, um, and get further information on everything I talked about, including our blog of engineer to mba our second challenge as engineers is um, the career plan challenge. Every business school asks, or most business schools ask, almost everyone, what are your plans for the future? What do you want to do after the MBA, long term, short term? And um, our challenge here is the shift from IT career to business career. A strong career plan for, engineer, for an engineer and actually for anyone applying to business school needs to be very exciting and realistic. It needs to be both, meaning that the admission committee needs to get the impression that you are likely to become a very senior person, possibly to be one day on the cover page of Forbes magazine or Business Week, uh, to become very famous, very successful. Uh, that would be very exciting for the admission committee. The other thing uh, that we need to have in a career plan is that it has to be realistic. If you say that in uh, 20 years you're going to be the CEO of Microsoft or Google, um, you need to convince the reader, the admission committee member, that it's likely to happen. Uh, and it needs to be realistic in a sense that it connects with your path and it connects with your short-term and mid-term goals. Now, as an engineer, your challenge is uh, what we call the career plan trap. If you talk about continuing as an engineer in the future, then you're being less exciting than others. Your career plan is less exciting because it's less likely that you'll be on the cover page of uh, Forbes magazine and that you'll be very famous and very successful and donate a ton of money to uh, the school. On the other hand, if you talk about switching careers, then um, you're becoming possibly less realistic, meaning your career plan may be less realistic than others. If you talk about becoming an investment banker, a strategy consultant, or a marketing uh, professional manager, um, you may uh, be more exciting in your career plan, but the career plan may be less realistic uh, because it connects with your past um, less well. What do we do about that? That's the challenge. 
Uh, the solution is often to go somewhere in the middle, meaning to do a half switch of the career, not a full switch of the career, and to still maintain some connection with your past. For example, if you accumulated knowledge in food production, because you're an engineer in a food production company, say Kraft Foods, for example, your career plan focus could be IT services for the food industry. Um, you could be a manager in the food industry or an entrepreneur in the food industry going to, from IT possibly in the future to uh, business line management and even to CEO position. So you could talk about becoming the CTO of a food industry company such as Kraft Foods again or becoming the, the, uh, the CIO, the Chief Information Officer, VP R&D, Chief Technology Officer, and then move to a CEO position. That could bring you both to uh, a career plan that's exciting. The CEO of Kraft Foods is, of course, a very prominent figure. And on the other hand, a career plan that's realistic in the sense that it is connected, it's well connected with your past uh, and with your engineering background. So you'll be more exciting and more realistic that way. Um, and you'll also be more differentiated. You'll be differentiated from other engineers who are not talking about the food industry. The, the fact that you're talking about specifically about a specific industry that you already have experience in is going to differentiate you a bit from other engineers. So there would be challenge to um, one more thing about the career plan, um, since we're talking about it, one important thing to keep in mind is that it's important to set your career plan now. Even if you're going to apply to business school in two years from now, in three years from now, it is valuable if you decide now what your short-term goals are going to be and what your long-term goals are going to be after business school. If you decide now what goals you're going to talk about in your MBA application. Why do you need to set it now? Why do you need to decide now? Because um, let's say you're going to talk, you, your career plan is going to be about IT engineering in food production. That means that from now on, until you apply, you want to accumulate more experience in this area. You want to accumulate more achievements in this area. You want to accumulate potential recommenders in this area. Therefore, knowing now that your career plan when you apply to an MBA program is going to be about um, food production, you will from now on take the right career steps and target the right recommenders and develop and accumulate the right achievements in order for everything to fit into place when you write in your application about your career plan. So you want to know as early as possible what your career plan is going to be about so that from now on you can make the right career decisions, the right job decisions until you apply so that your application is going to be stronger when you get there. If you need help with preparing your uh, career plan, of course, you can contact us at vocas.com slash introduction but you can also prepare it independently. As long as you do it now and as long as you think about what your career plan is going to be when you apply and you have an idea and you have a direction, uh, it, it will be good and you'll be able to make better career decisions from now on in terms of admission chances. That was challenge two and uh, now to challenge three. Challenge three for engineers would be to get out of the IT box. Um, if the admission reader, after reading your application, remembers you as yet another IT guy, oh, that's another IT guy from India, or another engineer from Japan, or another uh, U.S. IT professional, well, you're in a tough, tough pool. You're in a very tough pool because you have lots of competitors, and you're not so differentiated. And what could play here would be your GMAT score, your GPA, and probably you don't want to compete just on that because there's many smart guys out there. You want to compete um, in a differentiated way. Um, so you need to build your application in a way that the admission reader will remember you, not as the IT guy, but possibly as the banking technology guy, the food production technology guy, the distance learning startup guy, 
and other such terms, not the IT guy. You want to move from an IT guy label to a business label, to an industry label. You want to move from a geek label to a potential business leader label. That's how you want to be remembered when the admission reader, when the admission committee member finishes reading your application. They read hundreds and hundreds of applications. And at the end of the day, at the end of a week, they may only remember that you were an IT guy or that you were that food production IT guy. And if they, if, if they remember you as the food production guy, it's already one step further on differentiation and on being a distinct, a unique candidate. So, so far regarding challenges, let's talk a bit about opportunities as, as an engineer. Uh, your first opportunity would be um, growth. Uh, what do I mean by growth? As engineers, we often work in high growth industries, and we, uh, we want to bring it up. Often engineers finish writing a whole application without mentioning that their industry is growing 45% a year. So you want to bring it up because, again, you're then being more exciting to, them, to the admission committee. You're more likely to be part of a successful industry in the future. You have experience in a successful industry or in, in an industry that's going to explode in the future. So think about whether you can mention uh, the growth rate of your industry or of an industry that you're serving or of an industry that you know well it's part of your job, and write, mention this growth rate a few times in the application. Also remember that the admission committee reads thousands of applications, and if you, wanna, if you want them to remember something, you need to mention it in the application more than once. Your second opportunity as an engineer is buzzwords. As an engineer, you have a better chance of bringing up buzzwords and mentioning exciting buzzwords to um, the admission committee uh, than other candidates in other industries. As engineers, we are often part of well-buzzed industries, such as biotech, such as clean tech, such as alternative energy, such as nanotech. Um, just in my recent conversation with the head of uh, admissions at Harvard, Dee Leopold, she specifically mentioned her clear preference for uh, people who come from, from biotech, for example. And we also see that ourselves with the engineers that uh, we help prepare uh, for a client, that people who come from a uh, background in biotech or in nanotech or in uh, clean tech are more likely to get an interview at Harvard. We have seen often, uh, again and again, how people who come from clean, from clean tech, from biotech, get an interview, while others who are stronger candidates but are just IT guys or even are investment bankers would not have gotten an interview uh, at Harvard. We, um, we can see clearly a guy that would not have gotten an interview, and because they come from biotech, they get an interview. So if you are an engineer related to one of these industries, you want to bring it up again and again. You want to mention it again and again because the admission committee, again, reads so many applications so quickly that they may miss this fact. And you want to, if you are involved with one of these industries, you want to bring it up repeatedly in your application, in your essays, in your recommendations, in your resume, and in your admission interview to make sure they don't miss it. Um, by the way, in terms of, of bad words, uh, where our consultants, the vocal consultants, are having um, a conversation with Rod Garcia, the head of admission for MIT, uh, on May 11th in a couple of weeks. Um, so uh, keep an eye on our blog. We'll probably um, probably uh, post some updates from this conversation about buzzwords, about uh, focus, both for MIT and in general for uh, the upcoming uh, application season. So, um, so there would be the um, the, uh, the conversation. Our, our consultants are often uh, once in a couple of months we have uh, a conversation with uh, a different head of an admission committee. Um, so we put it on the blog, and you're most welcome to uh, to get updated um, there. Um, so just to wrap up the point about buzzwords, 
Um, even if only 10% of your work involved the uh, nanotech industry, you did just a, one project related to it, still possibly you want to put 80% of your application focus just on your projects in nanotech because it's a, it's a high growth industry. It's a strong buzzword. And I think 80% is, is exaggerated if, if only 10% of your work was involved in, uh, in this area, but still you want to put a lot of emphasis on it. So that's our second opportunity as engineers. The third opportunity is schools with fewer IT applicants. If you're thinking about MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Texas Macomb, and other such schools, you're going to be competing with many other engineers. Um, on the other hand, some, engineer, some schools are looking for engineers, uh, do not have enough strong engineers applying, um, and are interested in actually uh, accepting more strong engineers. Schools like Darden, London Business School, Kellogg, UCLA, USC, UNC, and such. Uh, in such schools, you may have an advantage. Uh, your background as an engineer may be an advantage. A small one often, but still uh, way less crowded than MIT, Carnegie, etc. Um, so just keep in mind and start researching and thinking about schools where less engineers are applying to. So that's a third opportunity or a, a third thing to think about when you're applying as an engineer. Uh, if you have any questions, want to talk about chances or other things, we're here at vocaz.com slash introduction. Uh, I wanted to thank you for listening and also see if you have any questions right now, you can uh, write them in the chat box, in the uh, question box um, right now on the uh, webinar uh, interface and I'll be happy to, uh, to uh, read your questions and uh, try to answer them right now. So I'm looking here if there's any questions. I see a question here. Are we, get, are we going to get a copy of this presentation? So uh, yes, there's going to be a copy. There's going to be a recording, actually, of this presentation. And it's going to appear both on the AGAC, uh, AIGAC.org um, website. And it's also going to appear on vocaz.com, our website. The recording should be up in a few days. So in a few days, uh, go to our website, vocaz.com, and you should be able to see a link there to the recording. The link will probably be on the blog, in the blog, and possibly also on the home page. Let me see other questions here. Sandeep is asking, how do you find application trends to school? I did not know Texas had a lot of engineers applying. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, Two answers here, how do you find application trends to school? One uh, would be to follow, follow forums, such as the Business Week forum. Um, and there's a lot of discussion there about trends, about changes, about who is applying where. Uh, the other option is just to be in touch. Uh, we'll be happy to update you uh, about where schools, uh, which schools are hotter, what the trends are, where engineers are applying, what the problems are. Uh, you can read it on our blog. Uh, you can also uh, contact Vocaz at vocaz.com slash introduction. Um, and that could be another option. Um, let me see if there's other questions here. Another question. What preparation do career switchers need to do about the new job or industry? Hmm. I hope I understand the question correctly. So she's asking, um, basically, if I am going to talk about a career switch in my application, uh, what do I need to do to prepare um, to prepare for, for this kind of application? Well, I'd say, first of all, um, if you're going to talk about a, a complete career switch in your application, it's probably going to put you uh, on a weaker spot as a candidate. Consider somehow connecting your career plan with your past. Uh, so that it's less of a switch. If you're going to do a complete switch and talk about it in your application, then probably right now, if you have time before applying, if you have a few months, a few years, uh, start accumulating some experience in this industry that you're going to talk about, even voluntarily, even just some projects 
but somehow uh, start accumulating some experience uh, in this industry so that you can talk about it in your application. Uh, oh, another question that I see here. Uh, the first grid that you showed, the one with the left-right side cutoff, where can I? Where can I get it? Where can I get a copy of it? Um, well, this, this screen uh, or this grid is called the Admission Driver System. It's, it's part of the VOCAS uh, IT system. Uh, and basically, as a client, uh, or even just after the first meeting, you'll have access to it, and you'll be able to play with it, either with your consultant or independently, uh, to basically plan uh, your application, both uh, horizontally and vertically, meaning to uh, uh, maximize your content in terms of admission drivers and to maximize the uh, admission drivers coming out of each essay. So uh, we'll be happy to help with that, and you can play with it for free. It's uh, available for all Vocal clients. I see the guys asking another question. Is that something Vocal uses or admission committee uses? Well, Vocal uses it as part of the application process. Uh, we use it to plan, track, and follow that you are preparing a strong, well-rounded, well-balanced, well-thought-of application. Um, the admission committee, they mostly use it in their head, meaning, you know, it will impress Harvard if they see strong leadership points in your application. Uh, it will impress Harvard if they see strong persuasion and presentation points in your application. Often, it's just in their head. Uh, sometimes it's on a grid, sometimes it's a check mark, it's a checklist, but often it's just in their head. And when they see all these strong points, they are impressed, they like you as a candidate. Of course, as I said, you want to put different emphasis on different schools. You want to, the admission drivers have to be calibrated in each application according to what each school is looking for and what admission drivers each school is looking for. Another thing to remember, Another risk is that some engineers tend to become an admission driver machine. You know, they just write an essay full of admission drivers one by one, and they lose authenticity, and they lose uh, the, uh, the personal touch, and they lose the sympathy of the, can of the reader. So you want to both communicate strong admission drivers, but you also want to maintain and keep the authenticity in your application. So I hope I answered this question. Um, and I see another question here. I work in IT industry insurance domain and would like to move towards entertainment industry. Well, I, I wonder what the question is. Uh, but it looks like uh, you want to move, you want to switch industries uh, from uh, from insurance to entertainment. Well, that's a tough, tough switch. Uh, you want to think about um, some connection. Either now start accumulating projects and doing some work in the entertainment industry, um, or think about how your industry insurance experience uh, could be applicable, or how your IT experience could be applicable to uh, entertainment. Uh, there has to be the, there has to be some connection in order for your application to be strong. Possibly the connection would be a, a, some technology. For example, in your insurance experience, you accumulated a lot of a lot of experience in a certain technology that's going to be very useful in the entertainment industry, and you want to bring this technology into the entertainment industry. And if you can already start doing some of that now. It will make it. It will make your application stronger, because again, if the application connects your past to your future, it's going to be a stronger application than one that just talks about a career switch. I see another question here, similar question about a guy. Uh, I work in the airline domain as a business intelligence consultant. My entire IT career has been focused on the airline domain. How would I use buzzwords to differentiate myself? Well, you have a problem here with the buzzwords, unfortunately. Not all of us are that lucky to be somehow involved in, uh, in clean tech, alternative energy, uh, biotech, counter-terrorism technologies, or other such things. 
Uh, and it looks like in your case, uh, it may not be the case where you have these strong buzzwords to bring up. However, if you're involved in, in airlines, as you mentioned here, and business intelligence, if it's somehow connected to counter-terrorism technology, that's quite a buzzword. Uh, if somehow you're related to that, uh, maybe bring it up. Okay, another question. Wow, lots of questions, guys. Uh, well done. It looks like I was able to keep you uh, until the end of the seminar, which is, which is nice. Um, so a guy is asking here, to be on the safer side, is it better to apply to business schools uh, than, than attract IT engineers? Well, I'm not sure what this question is. I'm sorry. So I'll have to uh, move on to the next one. Um, a guy is asking here, I do not understand your point about 10% of the work and 80% of the application work? That's a good question. Um, this question was asked by um, Namida, Namida Gar. Okay. Um, well, th the point is this. Let's say that only 90% of your work was involving just pure R&D work, developing software, solving technology problems, pure R&D work. There was 90% of the time what you did. 10% of the time, you did teamwork, you did some management, you did some leadership, you did some, you took some initiatives, you did some persuasion, you did some presentation, you did some project management, you did some budget management. It was only 10% of your time, okay? But during this 10%, you did a bit of these things. Well, Engineers have a tendency to just come and talk and keep that ratio. Talk 90% in their application about their R&D achievements and just 10% of the application about all these other things. Well, when you're applying to a business school, you want to reverse the ratios. You want to talk 90% of the time in your application, in your essays, in your recommendations, in your interview, you want to dedicate 90% of the content to these business-oriented things that you did, even if just 10% of your time was spent on them. In the application, give them 90% of the focus because they will give you points on admission drivers, on these things that the admission committee is looking for. And the R&D achievements are just going to give you points mostly on analytical skills, possibly on creativity, on problem solving, but it's not enough. You need points on leadership, you need points on persuasion, you need points on presentation, you need points on international experience, etc. That's why, especially if your GMAT is good enough, you don't want to spend too much time talking about your R&D experience, R&D achievements, and R&D work. Um, okay, another excellent question from Jeremy Schreiber. Uh, tech companies ask you to lead without being a formal boss. Can you sell that to HBS, etc.? Excellent question. Unfortunately, um, direct management, people management, being their boss, is going to be stronger than uh, than uh, being uh, their boss or just their matrix project manager. Uh, not being their formal boss, just being a project manager. That's weaker. That's unfortunately weaker. Uh, there's not much you can do about it. However, it's much better uh, to just to, to not have anything at all. So, of course, if you manage five people and was their boss, you want to bring it up again and again in your application. That's very impressive. If you only manage them on a project basis, um, you still want to bring it up a lot because it's still better than nothing and it's still better than many other engineers. Uh, so definitely talk about that, um, and it's still better than not talking about management at all. Another great question here from uh, Zinod. Uh, if an individual is working on the business or management side of an IT service company, will he be considered as an IT guy? Well, the quick question, the quick answer would be yes. Um, Will you be considered as an IT guy? It depends on what you write about in your application. The way you present it right now, 
I'm uh, I'm just working on the business side of an IT service company. Well, what I would have remembered is, uh, yeah, IT guy. However, if you put a lot of the emphasis on the business side, on the management side, and less emphasis on the IT side and on the IT words and on the technology words uh, and uh, more on the business words, on the business aspect, then you may not be remembered as an IT guy. And you may be you may be more differentiated. So it's all about what words you're using. Another question here from Stacy. He just talked about applying to schools where not many engineers would apply. How about the school's career support for engineers? Well, that's a great question. Um, first of all, unfortunately, engineers apply to all schools. I say unfortunately in terms of differentiation. Wherever you apply, you will have some competition uh, from um, from engineers. Um, in any case, Stacy is concerned about the school uh, career support for engineers. Um, and I would say in, in any school, uh, the career support is less for engineers and more uh, for business people, for people who want to go into business careers, into managerial careers. So you come in as an engineer, but you definitely want to go into mostly into a managerial position. Uh, and in that case, you'll have strong career support in any school, whether you're going into uh, into uh, high tech industry, the high tech industry, or other industries. Uh, most schools have uh, strong uh, placement services and career support in any of these industries. Not for R&D positions, but for management and our business positions. I see. Wow, the questions are great, guys. Well done. Um, uh, Vincent is, is asking, do engineers get analyzed against other engineers only, or is everyone thrown into a collective pool where we all compete? Excellent question, and the right answer is both, uh, meaning you uh, have to compete against other engineers and have to compete against everyone else. What do I mean by that? I mean that, let's say Harvard, um, what to diversify the class? They have a class of 900 people. They're not going to want 400 engineers in the class. On the other hand, they also are not going to want just 10 engineers in the class. They want to have somewhere in between. In that sense, you compete against other engineers that they're, they're not going to want to accept 400 engineers. Um, however, there's a lot of room in between 10 engineers and 400 engineers. So will Harvard accept 100 engineers? Possibly. Will they accept 50 engineers? Possibly. Will they accept 150 engineers? Possibly. In that sense, you compete against everyone else because the number of engineers that will be accepted depends on how strong these engineers are against the entire pool of applicants. So the answer would be both. Robert is asking, Instead of saying I'm from IT energy and want to go into business strategy consulting, should I say I want to go into energy or alternative energy consulting? Well, Robert, that could be an interesting twist. That could be an interesting change. I, I see that uh, my presentation has made some impact, and uh, I'm happy. Um, I'm happy to see that. Um, yeah, if you are in energy and you have some some project or some involvement in alternative energy, or you can develop such involvement from now until you apply, definitely bring alternative energy into your application. Do you want to talk about going into business role in alternative energy? Why not? If you're in IT right now, in energy, or in alternative energy, yes, you could switch into business roles. That's how have to switch. That's not a complete career switch because you're already in that industry. You may want to talk initially short term about some IT related role and then becoming gradually going into non-IT role and into CEO even type of position. So it could be that you want to go with a gradual kind of uh, progression even after business school. Still a bit of IT in energy or alternative energy going slowly into senior positions which are not in IT, eventually becoming CEO of an energy or an alternative energy company. 
B says thank you, welcome B. Um, and Namita is asking here, how helpful is the one-year MBA in making a switch from IT to business, especially if the applicant has more than eight years of experience? Well, this question is a bit beyond my expertise. You know, I was a member of the admission committee at Wharton, and I dedicated, I've been dedicating the last seven, eight years to helping people apply. Um, this question about um, whether it will be good for your career is a bit beyond uh, beyond my uh, expertise, uh, which is how to go to UN. Um, Sravan is asking, any idea about the schools offering a specialization in entertainment and technology other than NYU Stern, UCLA, and Columbia Business School? Yeah, take a look at USC as well, University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Um, and Raghavendra asks, if I'm interested in career switch to consulting, for example, will a job, job switch for a brief period, period before applying to this area help? Well, the brief, the brief answer would be yes. The deeper answer would be it depends what the new job is about. Uh, is the title also more senior? Are you going to be managing people or managing more people? Are you going to bring impressive achievements from this new job? Are you going to have a strong recommender from this new job? If yes, then definitely. And if not, then possibly this job switch is uh, not the right one. However, in general, yeah, if the job switch is reasonable in terms of the, the traits of the job, in terms of what you're going to do, um, then uh, the switch, yeah, it could be a good thing. Uh, I'm just concerned about your career plan or your career track being a bit twisted, a bit more complex. So it really depends on the details to answer your question. I would say the, the brief answer would be yes, but it's borderline and it really depends on the details. Um, Jeremy, oh, I also see uh, some good learning from, uh, from the presentation. Uh, Jeremy is asking, uh, if I don't have much community service, is it important to start now to get admission drivers on uh, community uh, contribution? Um, my answer to, to that would be depends when you're going to apply. That's the first question. If you're applying in a month, uh, then, you know, the admission committee may, uh, may see the trick and it may alien, alienate, alienate, sorry, uh, the admission committee member. It may, they may feel, oh, he's doing it just for the application. So if you're applying in two years, definitely. If you're applying in one month, possibly not. Why am I saying possibly? Because there's another aspect here. The other aspect is that um, if you are renewing some activity, some community activity that you've been doing four years ago, two years ago, eight years ago, and you're doing it again now, you're renewing it then if you present it in the right way and if you make a connection between the past and the present, then even if you renew it now for a relatively short period of time, it could still pass and it could still work. Uh, so in general, if you want to start renewing, if you want to start volunteering again, contributing again to the community, consider doing it um, in something you did in the past so that it looks more connected and it looks like you've been doing it long for a long time and not just for the application. UG is asking here, you emphasize that career switches might be considered not as realistic. Is it always not possible to accumulate experience in a desired field? Are there any alternative strategies such as self-study? As an example, I currently work in the software industry, but I'm very interested in clean tech and alternative energy. Can you give an example of how to make a link to present myself as more realistic. Well, a few things, Yuji. The first one would be that you can get in even with a career switch. You can get into any top school because if your other elements are strong, if your GPA, GMAT, achievements, resume, accommodations are strong, then you can get in with a career switch. However, uh, the career switch, you know, makes it a bit harder than if you are more connected with your current career somehow. 
Um, so that, that's one thing. The other thing is um, you're asking about uh, self-study and just you're interested in alternative energy and clean tech. Um, normally, if you put two career plans uh, on the line, one would be to talk about uh, your current industry, software, and a future in your in your in your current industry, and the other career uh, option would be to talk about clean tech alternative energy, where you did some self learning. I would go with the first one. I would go with the first one because it's less of a switch, and because uh, self learning is nice. Uh, but often it will not give a strong enough feeling of connection and of, of a realistic uh, chance that you will be able to, uh, to actualize your dream. It may not be enough. Um, let, let me see other questions here. Uh, William is asking, how important is the GMAT in the admission process? Well, in general, I would say that um, the GMAT is about 20% of the admission consideration. Now, I'm sure that many people will, like to, will now say, hey, 20%, why are you saying that? Um, I'm saying that based on experience, and it's a very rough kind of thing to say. So, of course, you know, some schools put more emphasis on the GMAT and some less. Um, 20% is not a formal number that any admission committee would tell you is true, but 20% uh, is, is just a very generic ballpark uh, benchmark to give you about how important the GMAT is. Um, the other thing would be that the, um, as you go beyond the average GMAT of the people admitted to the school, either above it or below it, the GMAT becomes more important than 20%. What do I mean by that? If your GMAT is 710 and you're applying to Wharton, then your GMAT is, is okay. It's about 20% of the deal. It's okay and, and it's fine. Um, it's not going to make a huge impact this way or the other. If your GMAT is very far from the average of the admits, for example, if your GMAT is 780 or 450, which is very far from the average of 710, then uh, your GMAT becomes more important and the weight becomes more than 20%. If your GMAT is 500, then your GMAT is 90% of the uh, admission consideration. You're not likely to get in. Uh, if your GMAT is 780, then it's also more than 20%. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a, a significant weight because it's so high. Uh, but as engineers, uh, still, many engineers have very high GMAT scores. Uh, and as engineers, I would say in general that our GMAT, as long as it's about 710, it's less important, especially in schools like Harvard, where there's less emphasis on the GMAT. Schools like Stanford, schools like Columbia, uh, schools like INSEAD put some more emphasis on the GMAT, and it may be a bit more important there. But in general, as engineers, it's very hard to differentiate ourselves on the GMAT, very difficult, because many of us have strong GMAT scores. Uh, Nick Hill is asking, will I be a good candidate for LBS with three years of telecom experience? Will less experience be a problem? Um, Nick Hill, I would say that the amount of experience is less important than what the experience is about. The business schools nowadays have a tendency to, to accept strong uh, candidates, even if they have very little experience. And on the other hand, to reject uh, candidates that have a lot of experience, but their experience is not that impressive. In general, there is a trend to accept younger candidates. Therefore, three years of tele telecom experience is definitely enough. Two years of telecom experience is on the low side. However, if it's very strong experience, if you're a very strong candidate, Two years may be enough, too. As you may know, Harvard has been accepting people with no experience at all in recent years. So uh, two years for LBS, yes, it is on the low side. It makes it way more of a challenge, but it's still possible. Three years, I would say, enough. And what's really important is what this experience is about and how strong it is. William is asking, is there a difference yeah, in applying in round one? 
uh, compared to round two. Hello? Hi, Gil. Thanks so much for this uh, informative webinar. I think we're running out of time here. Yeah, I guess we have to wrap it up, right? Right. So many thank great you. questions thank here. Well, thank you all for attending. And uh, please remember to provide your feedback, which we value highly. And if you're going to want to review this webinar later or other webinars, we'll have the recordings posted in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, you may be interested in articles posted today as part of AGAC Graduate Admission Summit or in some of the sessions to be held later today. You can check out both at www.aigac.org slash summit slash 2010. And uh, sorry about those questions we didn't get to, but um, we're out of time. So thanks again.